Hi everyone, and welcome to our five-week course on Christian apologetics, where we will be engaged in becoming more effective ambassadors for Christ in this modern age, an age of increasing hostility and intolerance towards the believer, an age in which arguments against God and objections against Christianity is household knowledge, an age where we see students and scholars abandon the faith at an alarming rate. Just a few weeks ago, we saw another Christian worship leader abandoning the faith. And I read to you from his uh, Twitter post. Even through this shift, there were still many things about Christian culture that made me uncomfortable. In fact, the list was growing. There were things that just didn't make sense to me. If God is all loving and all powerful, why is there evil in the world? Can he not do anything about it? Does he choose not to? Is the evil in the world a result of his desire to give us free will? Okay then, what about famine and disease and floods and all the suffering that isn't caused by humans and our free will? If God is loving, why does he send people to hell? My whole life people always asked, you have to go back to what the Bible says. I found, however, that consulting and discussing the Bible didn't answer my questions, it only amplified them. So we as the church can no longer avoid these why questions. As society has become post-Christian and post-truth, so also we as the church need to adapt and rethink our evangelism strategies in order for us to more effectively engage with the thinking and questioning world. Thank you for joining us on this amazing journey as we wish to engage more effectively with those around us in a loving and respectful manner with the aim in mind to present the gospel in the most impactful and relevant way. All of us have friends or colleagues or family members around us whom we wish to engage with and share the gospel with. And this is my prayer that through this course that God will equip us to do that. But before we get started, just a quick outline on how this course will work. Those of you doing the course should be added onto the WhatsApp group by now. Every Monday, an introductory video like this one will be uploaded. Also every Monday, you'll receive two documents on your WhatsApp group, a Word document and a PDF document. And these two identical documents contain all the session notes, the questions you'll work through, the links to videos that you'll watch, scriptures, quotes, and challenges that you do. You can complete these challenges and questions throughout the week and submit them by Sunday. If you have access to a computer, you can use the Word document and add your answers and responses. If you don't have access to a computer, you can open the PDF document on your cell phone and submit your questions and responses via email. I would like to encourage you to set apart sufficient time to engage with the content. Grab a friend and a family member and converse with them through the topics that we will be working through. Part one. What is apologetics and what is the basis for it? Now, apologetics is not the science of apologizing. Rather, it's defending the Christian faith. It's in giving an intellectual defense for the truth claims of Christianity. And it's in replying against objections made against Christianity or misunderstandings of what we believe. The word apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia which is a judicial term used in ancient Greece for an answer given or a defense made in reply. After a person was accused in a court of law, that person was given the opportunity to refute the charges made against him or her, to give an answer or a defense, to give an apologia. Throughout this course, we'll look at the three branches of modern apologetics. Firstly, offensive apologetics, it does not refer to offending someone, 
Rather, it refers to going on the attack and presenting arguments for the existence of God or the validity of the Bible or the resurrection of Christ. Defensive apologetics is in defending or refuting the claims made against Christianity or against a bloodthirsty God of the Old Testament, for example. In the third branch, conversational apologetics, um, we deal with skills and tools to engage with non-believers in a conversational manner. Now, not all of us, myself included, are well equipped um, in defensive or offensive apologetics, but all of us can sharpen our communication and conversational skills in order to point people to Christ as we converse with him. We now come to the scripture that acts as the cornerstone for Christian apologetics. 1 Peter 3, verse 15 to 16. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. What a phenomenal passage of scripture. And in your notes, we'll, you'll see that we have highlighted six of the phrases from verse 15. You will meditate upon them and reflect on the three most profound phrases for you. Let us quickly run through them. In your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. This gives us our main objective as Christians, as disciples, as apologists, to firstly set apart Christ as Lord in our own hearts. The ESV says, honor Christ as holy. Our main objective in life is not to present the most watertight argument for God's existence or even to win the most souls for his kingdom. Rather, it's encouraging and liberating to know that our main objective, our first focus in life, should be to submit to him as Lord of our lives and to keep on submitting to him as Lord. See, it's from this place of surrendering to him that good can flow from our lives, that he can use our weaknesses and our strengths to further his kingdom. In setting him apart as Lord, we declare to the world that he is the answer, that he is the creator, that he is the savior. If we don't submit to him, and if we don't set him apart as Lord, who are we pointing people to? And what are we pointing people to? But if we do submit to him as Lord, we can act as road signs pointing people to Christ. Always be prepared. This may speak of anticipating the questions that, this, that society will ask and are already asking. To give an answer, this is the Greek word apologia, to give a reason or a defense in reply. To everyone who asks you, this challenges me to live a life that will cause people to ask questions. Because if people ask questions, they are inviting me into a conversation. and They are giving me the platform to share my views and my beliefs. To give the reason for the hope that you have. This also challenges me to know why I believe what I believe. If someone sitting next to me on a plane sees me reading the Bible and asks me, Sir, why do you believe in Christianity? What will my response be? What will your response be? Why do you believe in Christ? But do this with gentleness and respect. The New King James Version says, in meekness and in fear. See, if we have all the answers and all the boldness and all the eloquence of speech, but we do not engage with other people in a loving and gentle manner. We do more harm than good. I would argue that it's more helpful for us to 
listen with respect and sincerity than to answer in arrogance and in disrespect. In this week, you will reflect upon scenarios where you yourself or other people have responded without gentleness and respect. Like I've mentioned, you'll, you'll also reflect on the three phrases that is most profound to you. I read you a quote from Ravi Zacharias. The scripture gives us a clear picture of the Christian apologist, one who has first set apart Christ in his or her heart as Lord, who responds with answers to the questioner with gentleness and respect. In the second part of this week's content, we'll look at examples of apologetics in the New Testament. In Acts 17, we read of Paul's travels and his ministry in Thessalonica, Berea, and Athens, where he so famously spoke to the Gentile philosophers at the Areopagus, also known as Mars Hill. And I read to us from verse 2 to 4, verse 17 and 34. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. Verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. But some men joined him and believed. And we see here in Acts 17 the fruit of Paul's laboring, of his reasoning that he did daily. In our notes, we'll also look at other examples of apologetics in the New Testament. One of them being when Paul was in Jerusalem, in the temple. And he was pulled out of the temple by the people of the city. They beat him up and they were about to kill him. When the commander of the garrison uh, heard of the news and rushed to the scene. He couldn't figure out what crime Paul had committed. And so he took Paul up to the barracks and here we read in Acts 21 verse from verse 37 and verse 40 then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks he said to the commander may I speak to you he replied can you speak Greek so when he had given him permission Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people and then there was a great silence he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, Brethren and fathers, hear my defense before you now. We see here that Paul speaks to the very people that were about to kill him. And he gives his defense. He gives his reasons for believing. He gives his apologia. And he shares with them his testimony. He shares with them what happened to him on the Damascus road. What a fascinating example of giving a reason for the hope that we have. Throughout the New Testament, we see that the early Christians were accused of many things. They were accused of blasphemy. They were accused of cannibalism in the communion. And they were accused of atheism as they did not believe in the many gods of the Greeks. But the question is, for us today, what are we as the church, what are we as Christians being accused of? Why do we need to give an apologia? And you will be reflecting on these questions. We as Christians are definitely being accused of a lot by the world. For example, the famous atheist Richard Dawkins has said, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak. A vindictive, vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser. A misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, 
genocidal, filicidal, etc. We see in the New Testament how Jesus appeals to his miracles and the prophecies that were fulfilled through his life when proving his claims to be the Messiah. We also see the apostles appealing to Jesus' miracles, the prophecies that he fulfilled, and his resurrection to prove their claims of Jesus being the Messiah. We also see this in Acts 2, where Peter engages with the Jews, and in Acts 17, when Paul engages with the Gentile philosophers. What is interesting to note is how Paul and Peter's approach is similar and how it is different. We all know that Paul and Peter's audiences have completely different worldviews. And this brings us to the third part of this week's content. Worldview. The lens, the filter through which we view life. How we look at the world around us. How we understand reality. And the assumptions that help us to make sense of reality. In order for us to present the gospel in a most impactful way, it will be very helpful for us to know what people believe and what they don't believe. And we see this in Acts 17. When Paul walks through the streets of Athens, he sees the idols, he knows and understands their worldview, and he's able to draw from their belief system when addressing them. He even refers to what the poets have said in verse 28. And I read to us from verse 22 to 23. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. It's interesting to note that Paul does not stand on Mars Hill to criticize or to find fault with their worldview. He even starts by complimenting them on how religious they are. Sometimes in our engage, engagements, we tend to first find fault or to criticize other people's views instead of finding common ground on which to build potential productive conversations. Ravi Zacharias once said, the old Indian proverb holds true. Once you've cut off a person's nose, there's no point in giving him a rose to smell. Thank you for listening to me in this introduction of the first week's content. In your notes, you'll find 11 questions and five short videos to work through. Enjoy engaging with the content. Next week, we'll be digging deeper into how we can understand someone else's worldview. There will also be a few nice challenges and conversations that we will be having. We'll also look at arguments and disagreement and doubt. And ultimately, next week, we will learn from Jesus. Thank you and see you next week.